Hello and welcome back everybody, I'm Necromanticer, and today we are going to be making our way into the frosted land of Elam Lois, but today we're going through with a little bit more knowledge on what is to come and on a character who's pretty much kitted out to face whatever we could be finding here in Elam Lois. Let's just give you a quick look at the setup. I've got pretty much all the weapons that I'm going to be wanting to use with uh, Pharos here. Uh, just keeping the Gurm Shield, Great Shield, just because it's it's a fun little bit of flavor for the character. It's not really taking up too much space, but this fine array of weapons here, all pretty much massive and very, very powerful. Not all of them. I, I did keep a few that are just really interesting little bits of utility and some that are just kind of funny, but uh, a bunch of really big weapons. The intention, at least, is to have a weapon of every weight class, Very basically a very large weapon, a medium weapon, and a small weapon at all times that I can switch to, as well as these two to cast any sort of spell or miracle, hex, sorcery, etc. that I could really want, and lastly, the little bow there to plink away as I might want to be doing, but that probably isn't going to come into play anytime soon. Right now, I'm doing PvE, but this is the character that I'm going to be... Oh, here's all this nonsense again. I've heard it all before. You're, you, you think you're so grandiose, but uh, I'm just going to keep on trucking. Suffice it to say that I'm going to be heading into New Game Plus to do some PvP in the Rat Bro Covenant since yeah, there's really not a whole lot of traffic in the Rat Bro Covenant at this stage of the game. Considering I'm already at level 200, I've completed the entire uh, New Game cycle except for Liam Lois and am pretty much ready to head on. Let's check. Yeah, four and a half million soul... billion soul memory. Not million. But that being said, it puts me in a really great spot to just hack and slash my way through Elaim Lois and really take some time to not really think about the combat, but to talk about what's going on and what the devs were doing when they made Elaim Lois. Hmm. Hmm, come on. Come on. There we go. That's rubbish. This is probably going to have to be buffed in order to be any good. It does basically the same damage as the uh, puzzling sword, so I'm going to go with the one that's a little bit faster and has a bit more of a chance to stun lock. But, that all being said, let's, let's just see how this works. Is it a complete gimmick? It is such a gimmick it's not even funny. But it'll be a fun gimmick, at least I hope. I'm a ballerina. Feel my wrath. Grab the winged spear, plus some stuff. I actually found that the winged spear is pretty, pretty fantastic for squishy, meaty foes. I have never had, never used it in the base game before, but recently I've started up a, a uh, just another character and got that drop early on and decided to go into using that in the early game and it actually does ridiculous amounts of damage and the fact is that its moveset is all pokes kind of like the hide knight spear so it's very consistent and very easy to play with you get a feel for it almost immediately and you almost never misjudge your moveset because you, you only have one moveset you just gotta ask yourself do I want to poke the enemy ahead of me or do I not? And if the answer is yes, you swing, and if not, no. Occasionally you might want to mix things up with a rolling attack in order to get a bit of a rolling slash, but it's it doesn't come up too often. This smelter sword is actually fantastic for taking these guys out. The guys with all the massive crystals on their back are usually rather difficult because they've got a lot of poise and are very difficult to backstab, if they can be at all. I'm still not confirmed one way or the other. I've had mixed results, and I can't quite recall at this point whether or not they can, but for everyone else, backstabs handle the situation 
quite, quite easily. As for what spells I'm going to be bringing into combat, I've decided that I want at least one from every school of magic. I'm going to be bringing Great Magic Barrier with some Recollection, Soul Shower, and Great Combustion to finish off anyone who's trying to stand up if I manage a backstab. Then again, if I'm using the Smelter Sword at the time, they're probably not going to be getting it back up, so it's, it's more of a uh, precaution rather than actual preparation. Let's move on in here. The whole outside area is very confusing your first time through, but once you have an idea of where you need to go and what the enemy positions are, it's actually quite easy to take them all out one at a time, especially if you're using a big massive weapon like this. The individual DLCs uh, kind of take different things. Depending on what area you're in, you might want a light small weapon or a big heavy hitting weapon like this smelter sword, but to be honest, the general trend is for rewarding really heavy hitting, really massive weapons. There are only a few areas where having a tiny fast weapon is any good, namely when you're encountering some of the bugs in, uh, whatchamacallit, Sholva, or, say, the really tiny enemies that, not tiny enemies, but the, uh, roly-poly enemies with the massive crystal spikes that deal bleed damage to you at, a, at the drop of a hat everywhere. They are pretty useful to have a nice, quick weapon to stun them out and deal with them a little bit easier. So, I'm trying to think if there are any enemies that really reward you for having a light quick attack and in the uh, second DLC, and it's just not coming to me. I don't believe so. I think pretty much all of the, maybe the uh, massive smelter uh, golems, as I call them. I don't know if that's their legitimate name, but that's what I call them, and I think it suits its purpose. Everyone understands what I'm talking about when I say that, but the smelter golems might reward having a light fast weapon as well, since you can get off a lot of hits and uh, there's no way you're going to stagger them in any meaningful capacity, so missing out on that isn't too much of an issue. Oh, bollocks. I'll just take the uh, guard break hits. If I... Something I want to try next time I come across one of them with the shield is if I can... Oh, hello. I was not expecting that. But I want to see if I can actually get the guard break if I just swing once, wait to recover, and then go for the guard break animation. Because that might make it all the easier to take them out. I'm pretty sure that the parry for Ultra Great Swords only gives you two ticks, but since I'm killing them in two hits anyways, it should still be enough to take him out. Something I didn't go over is my armor. Of course I have the Pharos Mask, and I love the look of the Wanderer's Coat, but two things that I changed out since last time was I actually equipped the Chaos Gloves because they're some of the best uh, lightweight armor for the hands in basically the entire game, at least that look decent. There are some that kind of ruin your fashion souls that can be considered okay, but they're not for me. And I also included the Sanctum Night Leggings, mostly because they give you the added effect of reducing fall damage. I don't actually expect that to come up in any meaningful capacity, but at the very least, it's another little knick-knack, little added effect that really suits the Pharos gimmick. Whereas other sorts of pants either don't look very nice or have no sort of interesting effect in which to uh, add to the Pharos gimmick. And the other thing about that is I, I really, at this point in the game, I, I fully believe that Pharos was a citizen of Sholva. That's where he came from. You can see all the... Oh, there's nothing over there. You can see all of his poison statues dotted around the city and lots of interesting locations. So it brings up the question of which came first, Sholva's uh, creation of them or Pharos's adaptation. Or maybe, and I believe this to be the most likely case, is that 
Faros came from Sholva and invented them there first, and merely brought his invention to the outer world when he left Sholva for whatever reason. I think this is best supported by the uh, one petrification statue trap that can be found in the key on route to the uh, challenge boss, the gangspank boss fight, because, oh, I forgot that that's what that moveset was. It's very useful for catching people out in PvP, but not so much if you're not expecting it in PvE. Let's see. Come on. Baiting these guys into a uh, forward swing is very easy, and they just leave themselves wide open for a backstab. Quick and simple. But as I was saying, the Pharos, uh, the massive statue with the Pharos face that breathes petrification with the alluring skulls in front of it right before the boss fog to fight the gangspank encounter, I think that is the best evidence that Pharos came from Sholva and then brought his invention to the rest of the world. I really feel that's what the devs are trying to get across, and it really fits as well, since uh, while Pharos did wander all over the place, he was a vagabond, as they say, it, it makes sense that his resting location is so related to his home. Since, well, not technically his home, since I feel that he co-opted, not co-opted, but founded a secondary kingdom once he had left as sort of home for the Gurm in the Doors of Pharos, but that is, again, a little bit of speculation because we don't know perfect, we're not 100% certain that the Gurm were there at the time of Pharos being there. It could be that, whatchamacallit, the Gurm simply came to inhabit the Doors of Pharos once Pharos and his people had all up and left. But given the connection to the Rat Covenant and all the underground sorts of things and Faros's sort of rejection of man, I believe that uh, that serves as pretty good evidence that he was indeed uh, related to the Gurm and their setup down in the Doors of Faros. So that's, that's pretty much where I'm at with the lore for Faros himself, but... There is still a bunch of questions up in the air, and I don't think that we're ever going to get a perfect answer. Like, here in a Lamb Lois, I mean, I'm still very conflicted about whether or not this is or can be considered uh, an Orlando. Because, again, it's the exact same architecture type. It is a massive wall with huge ramparts up top. It is... Everything about this place screams that it's from Dark Souls 1, but at the same time, we have factual confirmation that it is not and it cannot. While it's a great facsimile, what should we call it, the uh, Ivory King, the king of what I believe to be Ferosa. I think Elaine Lois is the kingdom of Ferosa. The Ivory King is described as being the... Uh, from Ferosa, and always the first to step up and defend his homeland, but it is slightly vague as to whether or not he left Ferosa to found Elaim Lois and thus created his own kingdom, or whether or not uh, Elaim Lois is a part of his kingdom and simply came to be as a bulwark between the old chaos that is found below and the rest of his kingdom, or this is just his attempt at uh, moving out and he happened to found a city on top of the old chaos and then proceeded to stop her it all up. So it is very ambiguous. This right here is a pretty great mechanic. I like this. I missed this the first time through. It's nothing particularly useful, but I did miss it. It is the Splintering Lightning Spear. I believe if I can take care of this guy long enough to pick it up. Yeah, Splintering Lightning Spear. It gives you a long-range AoE spell. It only hits for one tick and a very light amount of damage at that. But it is an interesting spell. I still think 
Heavenly Thunder provides a lot more utility, so I, I'm not really going to be using that on any builds, but it's a nice touch. But um, the fact that that ladder cannot be seen until you have the Eye of the Priestess, that's a good mechanic. And then they compound that by still allowing you to use the ladder even if you can't see it. So those of you who had taken the time to explore for secrets in other playthroughs will still have access to that same secret. I figured out what was going on here. Down below there's that uh, weird knight with the archdrake, not the archdrake, but the drake keeper halberd. And I was always wondering what exactly was up with him. And then I figured out that you can't see him until you grab this priestess's eye. Which pretty much speaks to me at least that he is your introduction to the unseen mechanic. The fact that there are enemies out there in Elaine Lois that you missed and have to go back through to take out and be able to see properly. It works really especially well if the player has attempted to fight Ava before because now they've come across an enemy that they haven't been able to see, grabbed a key item, and now be, been able to see it. So it's it goes a long way to teaching the player by item discovery, by natural progression rather than taking time out to explicitly explain something to the player. This is a really clever way to do it, and I think it works really nicely. Come on over here. I don't get why this is here. It could be to hide a loading, but at the same time, it never comes back. So I, I don't really know what's up with that. I have a suspicion that it's there to uh, protect people from invaders trying to get a weird sneak around on them and prevent them from progressing, but I can't be sure. And it just kind of, it's, it's there in the back of my mind. Oh God. Let's, let's try that again after I heal up. But we have confirmation that the Ivory King is, was originally a Ferosa and that he, and this is the important part, he is the one who built Elaine Lois. Which it goes pretty much the full way to proving that he isn't Gwyn. Uh, did I not rest at that bonfire? I need to stock back up. But... It immediately goes to proving that he's not Gwyn, since while he is very similar, everything about him is markedly different as well. He wields a ridiculous magic sword, his knights wear very distinct but different than the Black Knight's armor, uh, this whole kingdom is here in Drang Lake rather than over in the continent of Lordran. It's not a continent, but it gets very difficult to talk about because, well, Drang Lake isn't a continent either. It's just the largest kingdom that's uh, conquered all the nearby kingdoms. It's very difficult to talk about the continents because we haven't been given canonical names for them. Suffice it to say, when I say Drang Lake, I mean the entire continent that it's located upon. And when I say Lordran, I similarly mean the entire continent that Lordran from Dark Souls 1 is located upon, since we don't actually know one way or another what the specific continents are called. Okay, let's see. No, he wasn't actually blocking that time, so I didn't get to see if I could snag a guard break. Not today, sir. You get double tapped. Ultra Great Swords really are just fantastic weapons for PvE. They deal great amounts of damage, have wonderful stagger capacity, and their moveset is just so conducive to getting predictive hits, because that's honestly what you're meant to do with them in PvP as well, so it makes sense that they're just perfectly designed for it. Humbug. Let's take this guy out, and now I can deal with these two at my leisure. Nope, that didn't work at all. Again, th those guys with the crystals on their back are very interesting because they have very, I don't know, inconsistent levels of poise, defense, offense. They're, they're just very inconsistent. I think it has something to do with the fact that they are 
uh, defensive class enemies, which naturally have more health and poise than the rest. Like the spear-wielding... I believe it's this one, yeah. The spear-wielding um, knights in the Force of Fallen Giants. Infinipoise, lovely. Let's just... Let's see how Great Combustion handles this. Ha! Well, that's... That's fancy. I like that. I can work with that. Not today. God, it's... You have to play so defensive with these guys. Can I poke him to death? Nope. Stand down. No, I'm getting away. I can poke him to death. And the backstab. Well, excuse me. I backstabbed you fair and square. Humbug. I, I get so frustrated with the invaders and the DLCs. I just... Ugh. Really don't like it. FromSoft, you you done goofed with the invaders. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. You messed up. Now, I've taken care of most of the stuff on the first run. I'm ready to take on Ava, talk to good old Alsana. I I feel so bad, but I kept mispronouncing her name the entirety of my first time through. I originally read it as Aslana, and just never re-examined it and just kept saying it like that the entire time and I feel so sheepish because it's Alsana. I've been a little bit curious as to why they pick something so similar to Ilana. Ilana, Aslana, it's very similar. I didn't really think that would be something they would do, but it turns out they didn't. Right here, I'm gonna reformat my equipment because I want to have a very specifically useful weapon set to take on Ava. I don't want to have anything that isn't going to be particularly useful. I'm considering whether I actually want to use Dark Drift, but eh, I think the Chime will do me best. So, two quick dex weapons to chunk Ava whenever I'm nearby. I'm not going to need any of the magics that I have access to. So I'm just gonna get up in Ava's face, never go away, and hopefully that will do me right. Just stab, stab, stab. Something I might have wanted to do would be to, oh, get away, would be to grab the uh, old Leo ring because, oh, that's not gonna do very much at all. I'm very very underwhelmed by that damage. But I could get the old Leo ring because this puzzling sword has all piercing attack, thrust attacks on its uh, R1s, at least when two-handed, so I could get some pretty nasty counter damage going on here, but I think I missed out on my opportunity there. Oh, barely didn't get away in time, but I was nice and gives you opportunities to heal after almost every attack, so as long as you're not getting comboed, you can pretty much recover from anything. And he tell he, she, it telegraphs like it's nobody's business. I believe it's soul specifies one way or the other, but I don't quite remember right now, so forgive me for that. Whenever it goes into the uh, crystal soul mass move, just approach its O. Oh, approach its rear, and you can completely avoid the entire cast. Whenever he's jumping at you, uh, roll towards him, it, thing, and you should be totally okay. And just punish its back legs. Ooh, that is one of the few moves that can actually snag you back there. And, oh, come on. Come on. I just want my last two hits. I'm getting greedy, I'm gonna pay for it, but, okay. Now, now he dies. He took the time to cast, and I was fully mobile, and that's how you punish that move. Now to head on up and talk to Alsana, and we can do away with this whole storm down here. I think that's actually going to be where I'm cutting it. I am trying to, you know, hedge my episodes back. I know that it's very difficult to watch the longer episodes I put up, but that's I do that just because that's kind of the content that I prefer, 
I really enjoy Dark Souls content that's like an hour long on average, so I realize that that's not quite feasible for a lot of you, so I'm, I am going to be making a conscious effort to hedge it back. From now on, most, if not all, of my episodes should at least be under half an hour, and I'm going to see whether I can cut it back even further for different games that I'm going to be introducing in the coming weeks, so... That's that. I think I'm gonna end it here. No need to make you all wait through Alsana's uber long dialogue. So thank you so much for watching. I'm really looking forward to clearing out the rest of this DLC now that I'm very experienced with it. I have know pretty much everything that I'm gonna want to be saying and doing as I head through. And that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.